we look around outside of us, we see a lot of greed, anger, delusion, a lot of foolishness. And it gets discouraging. The world doesn't seem to be going in a better place, in a better direction. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And seeing this, there's many times the feeling that you want to get out. But then, of course, you look inside yourself and you've got the same greed, anger, and delusion, the same foolishness, the same up and down directions in your life. So what do you do? A lot of the issue lies in looking at the whole problem the way the Buddha looked at it. He talked about samsara. And samsara is not a place in the early Buddhist texts. It's a process. It's something people do. You wander on. You wander here, you wander there, you wander around. You create a lot of things. You create your sense of yourself. You create your sense of the world. And so it's important to look at that in that way. Because if you look at samsara as a place, then there's that whole issue, well, if you're getting yourself out of samsara, does that mean you're leaving everybody else to suffer in samsara? And isn't that a lack in compassion? But if you look at it as an activity where everybody's creating all kinds of suffering, out of their own lack of skill, then the issue becomes, well, there should be more skillfulness in the world. And where are you going to start? You know, you've got to start with yourself. You've got to learn how to master those skills yourself. Because on the one hand, when you, when you act more skillfully, less, fewer people suffer. You suffer less. The people around you suffer less. And at the same time, you, you act as an example to them. You can show them the way that they can stop creating less, that they can stop creating so much suffering for themselves. So it's not so much a question of getting out of a particular place as you just don't participate in unskillful activities anymore. Because the scary thing about seeing all that <coughs> greed or anger and delusion out there is you realize you've got the seeds for that stuff within you as well. And if you don't eradicate them, then no matter where you go, you're still going to carry those potentials. You can really feel safe only when they've been rooted out. Once they have been rooted out, then you can trust yourself wherever you go. And that's the greatest security there is. So as we're meditating here, it's not that we're trying to run away. We're trying to learn how to be more skillful in what we do in what we create, because it is a process of creation. We create form, we create feelings, we create perceptions, thought constructs. We even create our consciousness of things. There's an element of intention in all of these. We create these things, then we latch on to them. We set ourselves on fire with them. You might make an analogy that we're building a big bonfire to burn ourselves. And it keeps burning us, and we keep adding more fuel. And we complain about how hot it is and how much it hurts when we get burned. And yet we keep putting more fuel in because we don't know anything else to do. So what the Buddha has us do is to learn to be more skillful about what we create instead of creating suffering for ourselves and creating our sense of me, I'm this, I'm that. He says you take these things and you create a path. You work with the body, you work with form, you work with feeling, perceptions, constructs, consciousness. And all of them have the potential for becoming a path, like form. The word has many meanings, but one of them is that your, your internal sense of the body, the shape you feel sitting here. Okay, you focus on, in on that as your object of meditation. That's the breath moving through that shape. In fact, it's actually the, the basic point where you make contact with this sense of shape. 
if the breath weren't moving, okay, your, your sense of shape, the shape of the body would start dissolving away into a big mist. So you focus on the breath, you focus on form as a topic of meditation, as a topic of absorption, a theme for meditation, rather than worrying about whether it's a beautiful shape or not a beautiful shape. When you like or when you dislike, you just focus in on it and turn it into an awakened shape. Because there is that sense when the mind gets focused in on the body like this. Kind of wake up the nerves of the body. As you're aware of the whole body breathing in, the whole body breathing out, allowing all the sense of tension to relax, the energy starts flowing. And John Lee compares it to putting an electric current through the wire through the wires of your body. There's a sense of waking up. Once you have this, and you give, it gives this mind some, a place to settle down, something really comfortable to feed on. If you're going to feed on something, feed on this sense of comfort. Because he says the pleasure that comes from this ability to get the mind focused and absorbed is a blameless pleasure. It doesn't harm anybody else. It doesn't get in the way of discernment. So you use this sense of form as a path, rather than as a bonfire to burn yourself. The same with feelings. You try to get a sense, focus on where there's a sense of ease in the body, and you maximize that. Try to make it steady, and then just let it flow around through the body, in whatever parts that the flow can go. So you don't feel so impoverished in the present, because it's when you feel impoverished that you go out looking for things outside to make up for that sense of lack. But if you fill the body with a sense of rapture, fill it with a sense of ease, there's no, there's no hunger for things outside. The same with perception. You learn how to focus your, your thoughts on the breath. It's that metal label. You just keep going. Keep the mind on the breath, mind on the breath, mind on the breath. You use that facility of the mind. Since it's always labeling things, well, learn to label things skillfully. Label things that allow the mind to settle down. Once the mind is settled down, then you use those perceptions. The perception of inconstancy or impermanence, the perception of stress, the perception of not-self. In other words, the places that you tend to cling, you just analyze them to see that they really aren't lasting, they're, they're really not as pleasurable as you thought they were. You really don't want to hold on to them. There's no need to hold on to them. And that way you use perception as, as part of the path. The th same with thought constructs. The Buddha said there are basically three kinds that you want to learn about, the three kinds you need to know in order to let go. There's basically meritorious or basically good or skillful that thought constructs, unskillful ones, and then the ones that are neither skillful nor unskillful. Okay, you focus your thinking in skillful ways. You can, if your mind has trouble settling down, okay, you think about the Buddha. Think about him in ways that are inspiring. Or if he seems a little bit too unreal, too superhuman, you can think about the Sangha, the Noble Sangha. The word Sangha doesn't mean just anybody who sits and meditates. In its noble sense, it means people who have gotten at least to the point of stream entry. They've had their first taste of the deathless. And you look at the history of, of Buddhism, it's all kinds of people, men, women, children, poor people, rich people, monks, nuns, lay men, lay women, all kinds of people have been able to do this. Look at yourself. What are you? Well, you're a human being, too. You're a person, too. If they can do it, you can do it. So you just pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and just go right back. You find lust taking over the mind? Well, do two things. One, just look at the object of the lust. From all sides, you'll notice that the lust tends to focus on details. This little detail, that little detail really sets you off. Well, look at some of the other details of the body. 
to have a more all-encompassing view of this thing that's got you worked up. And when you see it from all sides, inside and out, it gets to a point where you don't really want it anymore. And then you turn around and you look at the quality of lust in the mind. Is it a good thing? Is it pleasurable? It always wants you to focus away. Don't it's like it's saying, "Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Let me look at that over there." But you turn around, and you look at the lust in and of itself. Once you've separated it from its object, and you realize that it's nothing that you would want to hang around. Nothing that you would want to trust. That kind of thinking helps to weaken the lust in the mind. As for anger, your thoughts of goodwill, and again, it's the same sort of thing. You learn how to develop goodwill for the person who's got you angry. You realize again that you're focusing on certain things and blanking out large parts of your awareness of that person. When you try to open up that awareness, open up your your mental image of that person, and you realize. That Either there are other details that are not helpful in keeping anger going at all, or else if the person is just really, really wretched and really mean and nasty, you've got to feel sorry for them. They're going down the straight road to hell. And so why do you want to get worked up about a person like that? Then you turn around and you look at the anger in and of itself as an event in the mind. And again, you realize it's not something you would want to trust, not something you would want to cultivate. It's an extremely unpleasant emotion. Again, it's always saying, don't look at me, look over there, look over there. But you turn around and keep looking at it, looking at it, and after a while you realize that you don't want this. And that helps it fade away. Another guardian meditation is contemplation of death. This is for when you're getting lazy. Say, well, I could meditate more tomorrow or next week or whatever. I don't have to do it right now. Well, you never really know. All kinds of little tiny things can happen in the body and get all messed up right here. It's little changes in, the, in your brain chemistry. Little tiny clots in the bloodstream just start wandering around, get lodged here, get lodged there. Weird little bacteria get in, in this tiny little cut you may have. Next thing you know, you're not in your body anymore. Are you ready for that? Well, if you're not, you've got work to do. You better do it now, because these things can happen at any time. So you learn to think in these ways as ways of getting you back on, getting yourself back on track. So it's, again, it's not the case that we don't think when we meditate. It's you bring out your thinking processes and you learn to use them in a skillful way. And same with consciousness. You realize as you sit, sit here, excuse me, you're sitting here, but please don't, as you sit here, that you're registering all kinds of things. There's sounds, sights, smells, tactile sensations. We can choose any of these to focus on. So right now you focus on the tactile sensation of having a body. Focus on the feeling of the body, how it feels as the energy flows, how it feels where the energy doesn't flow. And just try to hang on right there. That's what you want to be aware of. So what you're doing is that you're taking the five khandhas, which you normally you use to burn yourself, and you turn them into a path. It's taking, like taking wood from a fire and instead building a bridge with it. Once it gets you to the other shore, okay, then you don't have to worry about the bridge anymore. If it happens to get washed away by the river, well, that's, that's okay, but you're on the other shore. In the meantime, though, you've got to be very careful about what you're building. You don't want to build a bridge and then start making it into a fuel for a fire halfway over. You've got the raw material here, just learn how to use it properly. That's basically what the Buddha is saying. Learn how to use it skillfully. 
once you use it skillfully, well, other people can take it as an example. So again, it's not that we're trying to get out of a place where everybody's suffering, just kind of running off and not worried about them at all. It's just more of it that everybody's involved in this big mass of unskillful activity. And you can't other, get other people to be more skillful. Skill is something that each person has to develop for him or herself alone. But you find that as you act more skillfully, one, you suffer less. The people around you suffer less, and then they also have you as an example. They see that, yes, bridges can be built. We don't, don't all have to be sitting here creating bonfires to burn ourselves. Just that much is a real gift, both to yourself and to those around you.